Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmate Sodcast. Uh, glad to have you with us uh, for this episode with Dr. Tim McAllister. He's a research scientist, a ruminant nutrition and microbiology specialty, uh, ag, agriculture and agri-food Canada, uh, working out of Lethbridge. Um, and welcome, Dr. McAllister. Thanks very much, Peter, for having me. Um, so let's let's dive into how one becomes interested in ruminant uh, nutrition, although clearly everyone should be. But how did you become interested in ruminant nutrition? Well, it really, really all, you know, my, my original interest was actually related to rumen microbiology and the fascinating ecosystem within the digestive tract of of ruminant animals and, you know, the ability of ruminants to utilize uh, feedstuffs like grasses and uh, waste material like straw and that coming out of, you know, those really difficult to digest feedstuffs that, uh, you know, humans typically don't do a good job of using as a, as a food source. And, and it was really, you know, I was interested in how do cows do this? How do cows produce milk and meat from this seemingly indigestible material and I started to realize it was all because of that room and microbial population and the, the fascinating ecosystem that's there, the diversity of organisms and the density of organisms. You know, it's, it, you know, from my perspective, it's from a microbial ecology perspective, it's one of the most fascinating uh, microbial communities in nature. So that was really what got me started. And that was the focus of my PhD was actually studying that that community and then my additional work in microbiology and that kind of branched out from there and then into nutrition as well. I, I always say that you really can't uh, figure out how to feed the cow if you don't understand how to feed the microbes. So that was sort of where I started. Uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in a, a town on a farm, a mixed cow-calf operation just outside of Innisfail. So it's in in central Alberta here, it's it's pretty good soil, pretty good grassland conditions. And we weren't a huge farm. We only had 100 cows, but uh, it was a nice place to grow up. Mm. And and you, so your final degree was from Guelph University? Uh, my PhD, my final PhD was out of the University of Guelph, actually. Yeah, in, in both microbiology and nutrition is what I studied. Yeah. So what we have is this wonderful symbiotic relationship where the host animal, to simplify greatly, is raising this crop of microorganisms and then harvesting them and their byproducts. That's correct. Yeah. So it's really the microbes within the rumen that are have the capacity. They're the ones that produce the enzymes that break down the plant cell walls. And they basically produce what to the microbes are are uh, waste products from their perspective because they derive energy from that breakdown process. But those waste products in turn then are utilized directly by the animal uh, for the production of the meat and milk that they, they produce and the maintenance of their, their functional and bodily activities that, uh, that they carry. So that all comes from the microbes uh, and it's why they're so efficient at using that, those, those grasses and, and uh, straws and other, other types of difficult to digest uh, products. You know, poultry or swine won't do very well on, on those types of feeds. Or us. No, exactly, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's always dangerous to compare us to swine, but um, yeah. <laughs> from a physiological point of view, it maybe isn't yeah. such a big stretch. No, it's a pretty good model, actually, yeah. Um, and, and what's more, not only can they utilize those resources, but those resources are, or at least the grasslands themselves are far larger than the arable land area. Yeah, like a lot of, a lot of those extensive rangelands are on lands that are really not suitable for crop production. So, uh, and, and we don't really, you know, disruption of those lands and using them, you know, forcing them into cultivation can cause a lot of environmental damage, you know, from a water quality perspective, erosion, often uh, the topography of those lands are not really very favorable for, for crop production. And so you can have increased rates of, of wind and water erosion 
as well. And then, you know, the other thing that's really important to think about with those grassland ecosystems is, is that they really store vast quantities of carbon. And, and when we cultivate up that land, you know, we disturb the soil biome and we cause it to gain an activity that causes that carbon to be broken down and released as, as carbon dioxide. And it contributes to climate change as a result of, of that disruption. So it, we, we had a little technical glitch. I just want to make sure that we get the, the point about um, the disruption of that soil ecosystem leading to a loss of soil carbon because we are cultivating. That would happen in any soil that we cultivate. That's but correct. Because these grasslands are so extensive, it just... It, 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 I think it's something on the order of a quarter of the land area is in some kind of permanent range pasture land. That's correct. That's correct. And and the, the like the level of carbon in those ranges differs depending upon soil type and plant vegetation, and those are all factors that influence that that carbon. But you know, regardless, disruption of that ecosystem through cultivation will cause a release of carbon. Uh, into the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. As well as hydrologic function of those watersheds. That's right. So, so yeah, that, that, that intact uh, ecosystem, like the plants that uh, occupy the surface of the land, they're very important in terms of slowing down the flow of water. Uh, the root systems act as filtration devices as well to capture nutrients before they have an opportunity to enter into the groundwater. You know, of course, that's all dependent upon how that area is managed as well in terms of what the stocking rates would be or what the fertilizer or manure application rates may be. Like those things can all fluence. You know, any, any ecosystem should be considered from a nutrient balance perspective, whether it's a cropland or a grassland ecosystem. Like we need to consider nutrient flows and nutrient balances within the management of those lands. And, and, and truly, it's possible for damage to be done to ecosystem through mismanagement of yeah. either crop or livestock. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, you know, we, we have recommended stocking densities. Those stocking densities for grassland ecosystems are not necessarily constant. Uh, they differ depending upon the environment. And we know that, you know, weather differs from year to year. So rainfall availability can influence that. So producers need to manage according to the environment in that particular year and adjust their stocking rates accordingly so that they match it, you know, and that's part of the nutrient flow utilized uh, point that I made, you know, there's, there's crop that's the, 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 uh, the various forages in that grow as a result of capturing of carbon from the atmosphere during photosynthesis. The animals harvest that material as well, but there has to be a nutrient balance so that they don't harvest so much that that plants can't reside over the winter and regrow in the following spring. And you, you want, you know, those, uh, forages to maintain within that ecosystem. You don't want them to have so much pressure on them that the energetic demands as a result of consumption of the animal offsets their ability to survive and persist within that environment. So those, those are some of the balances and checks that I, I mentioned, that, you know, and you can do the same thing for, for nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium as well. The, the other nutrients that may or may enter that environment and, and be utilized by the plants or flow from that environment if they're applied in excessive requirements. And in some of the lower rainfall, it may be only once a year or- Oh, yes. The, the, yeah, that's graze, why, but you know, exactly. Even, even when you talk about grazing management, you know, we hear a lot about rotational grazing and and how valuable that can be because the animals harvest that plant material in the first rotation. Uh, then they give an opportunity for that material to rest and, and, and regain its energy again and, and continue to capture photosynthesis, you know, through photosynthesis, capture carbon, regrow, and then potentially be grazed again in a rotational grazing type of system. But that system is dependent also on adequate rainfall. If there's no rainfall after that initial grazing, then you're basically with a single rotation system. You can't have multiple rotations if the crop doesn't get, you know, you know, nutrients are only one component, sunlight, water, they need that entire package to have a productive uh, ecosystem. And, and so uh, as a result, then uh, you need to, you know, monitor and manage all of those factors simultaneously and adjust that stocking rate to match the availability of the plants that are there. 
mm-hmm. uh, to ensure the system. You know, that's all part of the sustainability of that ecosystem is is managing it in a manner that is sustainable. So, for people who aren't uh, fully uh, familiar with geolo- geography of uh, Alberta, where is Lethbridge? Uh, Lethbridge is uh, just above Montana. So we're in the grassland ecosystem here in, in, in Lethbridge. This was uh, originally part of the North American grassland. Uh, the short grass prairie is is in this region. Um, and, and so we're, those grasslands extend right up to north of here, uh, close to Calgary. So that's about another 200 kilometers north of where I'm located. It's where the parkland ecosystem starts. So grassland to parkland, parkland being? Yeah, parkland is, is uh, more the aspen forest area. Uh, the rainfall levels there are higher and trees actually grow. Like here, uh, in, in the native condition, trees would only be growing in the river valleys. Uh, there, there, were, there wasn't trees on the open grassland. So, mm. yeah. And then the parkland transitions into the boreal forest as you go further north. And that would be the, the shorter season, shallower yes, soil. Yes, yeah, that gets up north where, you know, you're looking at a month and a half to two months less of a growing season than what we have here in, in southern Alberta. Uh, much higher moisture levels. There's a lot of uh, bog type conditions and, you know, uh, that kind of system and more, more rocky terrain as well. So less, less suitable uh, up in the Peace River area, which is a far north part of Alberta. Uh, there is agricultural areas there that touch on the boreal forest, uh, but the boreal forest is, is generally, for the most part, not very suitable for agriculture. And I'm assuming that where you are was covered by glacier, Yes, uh, yeah, the, the glaciers last... extended right down through into Montana. There was only one area in southern Alberta. It's known as the Cypress Hills, which has a higher elevation. It's in the far southern corner of Alberta. And that's a, got a unique ecosystem there because it actually wasn't glaciated in those hills. And, and there are some fauna there that are unique to that uh, location because of that. So it's kind of an interesting uh, observation. But that's all part of the grasslands. And, and when... Uh, Europeans first settled this area, it was in this area that they did it because uh, they could basically till the land directly. If you go further north and you get up into that parkland region, there was a lot of uh, clearing of trees that needed to be done before uh, planting of crops could take place. So the original colonization and settlement occurred here in the southern part where they could immediately come out from the, you know, across the country and hopefully get a crop in within that season to have something to eat over the winter time. So. Mm. That's mm. quite established here. So the soils that were built essentially had been built over the last 15 plus or minus thousand years. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. About the last glaciation, res- res- uh, residing of it was about 10,000 years ago. Mm. Uh, fascinating. So we've touched on it a little bit, but I think it's really important that I it's it's a personal thing and you don't have to go there. I think animal source foods are essential for human health. Okay, fine. But the production of those animal source foods, the impacts differ depending on if you're talking about monogastric or similar, so poultry, fish, swine versus ruminants. And you've already mentioned that the vast majority, even in North America with our production systems, the vast majority of the feed going in is not human utilizable. So there's not that. But even in a, if we think of a natural grassland ecosystem, the ruminants are this critical link in the energy flow from photosynthesis through the rest of the, 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 community of of life in that um ecosystem that, that that's right so so it, as we described that that ecosystem captures carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis over the duration of the year uh and and it builds biomass as a result of that that biomass will accumulate over the season and it will persist there as the plants go into dormancy so it ends up you know we call that aftermath if it's not utilized by ungulates. So, but the grazing can utilize some of that material. It also then will lower, you know, if we have 
uh, it, you know, fire was part of the prairie ecosystem. And, and so those fire events, you know, the extremes of those are less extreme. Uh, you know, the fire doesn't burn as deeply into the ground if there is grazers or grazers are part of that ecosystem because they utilize that aftermath. They derive uh, energy from it, as we described, as a result of those rooming microorganisms breaking that material down and support the milk and, and meat production. Um, so those, those are very important parts of that. So that animal is integrated into that ecosystem, you know, much as, you know, playing the role very similar to what the bison would have done prior to European colonization here in, in North America. So, uh, and you know, that, I think it's important to realize too that other members of that ecosystem, birds, uh, insects, et cetera, also rely on those large ungulates to be part of that ecosystem. So uh, it depends on the birds, you know, there's obviously there would be variation in terms of that amount of aftermath. If you look at when the bison herds moved across the plains, they didn't graze every single location every year. So some locations would have more aftermath, some locations would have less if, if they'd have been recently grazed. And, you know, the bird species that adapt to those ecosystems, adapt to those specifically, there's certain species certain rodents that prefer higher levels of grasslands, you know, more aftermath to be present, others that prefer to have less. And, and so they've evolved specifically to match each of those environments and varying the grazing practices can create those environments uh, even today by using cattle to do that, that favors those species to persist. Um, you know, quite in contrast to the type of disruption that we have if we cultivate those grasslands up. You know, on a yearly basis and that disruption. And if you look at that, you know, the, the objective is from a cultivation perspective is to plant that entire field, right? There's an investment that's went in to cultivate that field up, uh, potentially to drain some of the wetter areas so that they can also be used for cropping purposes. So, you know, you don't see many fields that are partially planted where part is that, you know, set aside uh, to support the greater development of biodiversity. They plant typically in most cases, a, a monoculture crop, crop over that entire land area. The only areas uh, where there is some diversity would be in the fence lines or in the ditches and those areas that you see that are not directly cropped. Hmm. Relative so to small you used to, a, term, to a grassland. You used the term ungulate? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that would include like uh, other, you know, wild ruminants are part of that land as well, right? We have elk and deer. Uh, pronghorn antelope, those, those also persist within those same environments. Uh, they share them with the cattle. Mm -hmm. um, and I, be, I was given your name when I pursued finding out more about uh, Guardians of the Grasslands, which is a recently released um, film about the efforts to maintain the grassland resources of Canada. Um, so, and we've, we've just brushed across it, but one of the lines that struck me was this idea of cattle sharing the ecosystem as opposed to other food producing activities, forms of agriculture in the way that you just described it. Um, that if you're going to grow crops, you're going to have to cultivate. In some places, that's not wise. In other places, the soil arguably might be fitted for it, but it creates a very different dynamic in that ecosystem than what's possible with well-managed ruminant agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Like the level of, of fragmentation of the, of the landscape is far greater. You know, when we use the term land use change, that's a big part of cultivation. They also tend to, you know, many areas in the world will uh, equate land use change to ruminants as well as a result of deforestation and then utilization of those lands for grazing systems. But that's a very, you know, that's a very different scenario than what we're talking about here, where these are natural grassland ecosystems, uh, ruminant animals in that system, you know, for millennia, and basically the cattle are now replacing the role of bison uh, within that ecosystem. So, you know, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind as well, like within agriculture production systems, is that there's a massive diversity out there. And, you know, we're always talking about trade-offs. So you're correct in that you made the point that uh, 
and most people wouldn't realize it, but even with our intensive feedlot production systems that we have in both the United States and Canada, if you look at the total amount of feed that's utilized to maintain the beef herd as a whole, 80% of that is still forages. So grains actually comprise a relatively small portion of the diet of the entire beef herd. Where they are, they're used intensively in the feedlot. That's where the majority, by far the majority of the grains would be fed. But that represents a relatively short period of you know, 120 to 200 days of the animal's life cycle. The rest of the time, they're utilizing forages. And even in those feedlot situations, we do have forages included in the diet. Often they're crop forages. They may be silages like corn silage or, or others, but they're still forages, you know, that it wouldn't be well utilized by monogastric animals like poultry and, and swine. So, yeah, for, forage, and, and I think most people don't realize, like if you drive across the countryside, like you said, driving across the Western United States, or if you drive across the prairie in 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 the in, in Western Canada, and you look out the window, you, you'll see vast quantities of grassland and vast quantities of 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 hayland that's being used to produce forage as well. And I I think that most people don't realize that you know food production from those lands or from that those forages that are produced only occurs because of ruminant animal. Uh, otherwise, they don't produce food food that's really usable by humans. And 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 you, you know, if we look at where we're going with the increase in population and the projected demand for protein in the human diet, then uh, we need to use those lands to produce that protein in a sustainable manner. And and we can do that by proper management of those grassland ecosystems. And and it's we've the the industries have spent a lot of time emphasizing protein and we spent by my understanding, too much time worrying about lean protein, but I know how we got there. Yeah. Um, the, the, the fact is it's specific amino acids that we need and specific ones are limiting. And the ruminant, because of its unique digestion, digestion and the microbial population that you mentioned, is capable of even taking non-protein nitrogen and converting it into highest quality protein of complete amino acid profile. So this is another critical aspect of it's not energy transfer would be enough, <laughs> but it, it, wait, there's more. It's the yeah. production. Yeah, of well, well, a lot of those, you know, when I, I described that aftermath, you know, not only is it highly lignified, you know, which means it's, resistant to digestion. That's one, one of the reasons why humans cannot make use of that as a, as a food source. Uh, but it's also typically also very low in protein. Uh, and and uh, so that means that most animals can't do very well on that material because the protein level is too low to meet their requirements. But ruminant animals, they have the capacity because they have that microbial population in the rumen. And I didn't get into it earlier, but basically that microbials, those microbes, and there's there's protozoa, fungi, and bacteria that reside in that environment. And they derive energy and they grow and, and they produce protein as they grow. Um, now, the, the ruminant animal actually has a very unique ability to recycle urea, which is in most livestock is a, just a waste product that's excreted in the urine. But the ability to uh, recycle that non-protein nitrogen source uh, from the liver back into the rumen and provide that nitrogen to the microbes that reside in there that's what they utilize to produce that protein. And the other unique thing is that those microbes, you know, we talk about uh, the need to have essential amino acids in our diets as humans. And that's because we lack the capacity to synthesize, metabolic capacity to synthesize those amino acids. So the only way we can uh, obtain them is through our diet. The microbes have the capacity to synthesize those essential amino acids. So they can, they can produce those amino acids right in the cow and provide those amino acids to the cow directly uh, as they flow down the digestive tract and they're broken down. So that's quite a unique property and why ruminant animals can persist on such low protein diets as well. So a mature cow at maintenance, lowest level, she needs what kind of percent crude protein? Oh, eight, eight percent, six to eight percent. Mm -hmm. So very, very low. And that's without supplementing with a non-protein nitrogen source. You know, we, 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 we can use urea. It's not used too much in extensive rangeland conditions, but we, 
we do use it uh, in 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 uh, confinement for sure. It's a, an important non-protein nitrogen source that we include in the diet. And of course, a lot of what is called crude protein from plants, a significant amount of that is itself non-protein nitrogen. That's source. correct. Yeah, yeah. There'd be nitrates, you know, that would there'd be nitrogen compounds like that. Uh, some of the uh, uh, the uh, genetic material like the that makes up dna and and that is also non-protein nitrogen because it's not part of uh, protein and nitrogen in there but the microbes can break those down and and utilize that all as a nitrogen source to synthesize uh those essential amino acids that they they need to grow themselves and then those essential amino acids in turn become available to the cow after the microbes are digested as they flow out of the digestive out of the rumen into the lower digestive tract how so you mentioned bacteria protozoa fungi broadly speaking are there primary roles uh, for those are are some more preying on other microbes and some more active at breaking yeah, down well, there, fiber? there's a i always like to make the analogy that if you look at the ecosystem within the rumen you know and i think one of the ecosystems we're probably most fascinated by on tv is the African savanna, you know, when you see the variety of mammals and predators and prey and all the interactions that are going on there. And I always like to make the the, uh, the point that the rumen environment is every bit as complex, if not more complex than what we see on the African savanna in terms of the predators that are there. So the protozoa prey on the bacteria, they can also graze on the fungi. Uh, the, the, the bacteria are the predominant organisms in terms of numbers. But the protozoa are about 200 times larger than the bacteria are. And so, and interestingly enough, you know, as we go to some of these grassland ecosystems, the more complex becomes that members of that community. So we, we see a greater diversity of protozoa. We see more fungi being present under those complex uh, grazing systems because we need those complex communities in order to break down that difficult material. So, you know, if you wanted to say, you know, we talk about how grassland ecosystems have a positive impact on biodiversity within the ecosystem as a whole. They even have a positive impact on biodiversity within the rumen as well, mm -hmm. uh, result of their of, of the animals consuming them. So, so it, I've I've seen various figures. Some, uh, uh, but basically, one of the things is that fat is not a good substance in the rumen for that microorganism population. So uh, we we can't have very much ether extract yeah, or fat in. We're usually restricted to, you know, and I think that if you go back to my point that I made, you know, and ultimately even the wild cattle have evolved in grazing ecosystems just like the bison did, right? And, mm -hmm. and so if you look at that scenario, those animals would not have come in contact with a canola field, for example, or a soybean meal field, right? Really? So they would never consume the quantity of oil that they could potentially consume under those conditions. And as a result, the microbial population as it evolved with the animal really didn't evolve to handle high levels of oil in the diet or fats. We typically have a rule of thumb that we don't exceed 6% of the dietary dry matter as being lipids. Uh, in our diets. What happens if we exceed that, and it probably reflects again the evolutionary patterns that I've described, uh, is that we, the first negative effect we see is an, an inhibition of fiber digestion. And it's those fiber digesting bacteria that again are responsible for breaking down those grassland ecosystems. Those fiber digesting bacteria would not have been exposed to those high oil fat levels. So they're probably the first ones that are negatively impacted if we exceed that 6% level. Uh, so that's uh, a, a rule of thumb that we usually follow. Now, at that level and below, then they can be a, a useful energy source for the ruminant animal. Uh, and there's also quite a bit of data showing that they'll lower methane emissions as well, uh, because the effect, uh, the balance of the end products that I mentioned that are produced there in a manner that uh, more of a particular product called propionate tends to be produced. And when more propionate is produced, you have less methane. So there's a there's quite a bit of data out there showing that additions of lipids to the diets can also lower methane emissions in ruminants as well. And the, the challenge, of course, is balance in everything. It's 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 yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's understanding, you know, that's why I get back to saying that you can't feed the cow if you don't know how to feed the microbes because uh, you need to understand how those microbial populations are going to respond because that will impact then the productivity of the cow as well. And and the the nature of the rumen as part of the digestive anatomy is that it's not a flow through. It's no, a it's fill not. and got to empty. No, no. Even, even though, uh, you know, I, I think I've emphasized how efficient that ecosystem is at digesting plant material. They still need a period of time in order to carry out that function. It's not like, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why we have higher productivity on it if we add grain to the diet, because the starch is much more rapidly broken down. So that energy is made available uh, in a shorter period of time, and that can affect intake, so the animals can consume more if it's digested faster. Uh, the, you know, the microbes colonize it faster. The populations that carry out the digestion of starch are not as complex as those that carry out the digestion of fiber. So even in that situation, that's one of the reasons why the rumen has such a huge volume, is because that material then can be retained you know, for periods of hours, you know, 12, 18, even up to 24 hours uh, within that rumen environment to give that microbial population enough time to establish that complexity, colonize that material and produce the various enzymes. There's a, a huge number of enzymes that are required that they produce in order to break down that plant, that plant cell wall material. The plant cell wall material, the plant cells themselves are much, much more chemically complex than something like starch. And you can you know, the more enzymes that are required, then that means you need a greater diversity of microbes in order to carry out that digestion because not all microbes produce all enzymes. So then you need them to get partnerships together to work together to carry out to digest that feed. If one of the partners doesn't show up to the party, then you end up with less digestion because you need that individual in order to advance the digestion of that plant cell wall material further. So all of those things combined uh, make it a, a much more complex system and the reason why uh, that material has to be retained in that room for a longer period of time than what we get in a monogastric animal. And th this may be an oversimplification, but my image is you've got an animal that evolved to gather feed quickly and get it into the rumen and then go off somewhere safer and process that over time. And yes. And so there's not a lot of chewing when the cow eats. She, she gathers with her tongue because she doesn't have upper incisors. So she makes bolus, you know, to get them swallowed. And then they're brought back up in rumination. Maybe we should describe that just a It's a mechanical as well as enzymatic breakdown to get it small enough to then leave the rumen. Yeah. Yeah. So... So it, the rumen itself is, is, you know, we call it a fermentation vat, but that's, that's a bit simplistic because that's, you know, typically when we think about a, a vat for brewing, it just sits there and, you know, things bubble away inside of that and we end up with beer at the end of the day. But in the rumen, it's more complex than that. So you've got that complex microbial population, but that rumen also goes through a series of contractions. So that material is complete, you know, continuously being mixed within that rumen environment to improve the interaction between the feed and the microbes that reside there. Now, at the, at the same time, you know, even the microbes, as I mentioned, can have a challenge in terms of digesting some of that material. Not all of it is digestible. Some of it's indigestible. And if you measure, you know, the composition of feces, you will find that the majority of that composition is the fiber that was not digested by that microbial population because it was too difficult. Maybe the time was too short or that right community wasn't there to carry out the digestion that I described. Uh, and at the same time then, where the microbes can attack and, attack and break it down more rapidly is in the damaged ends. So when the animal eats the grass and breaks it off, those damaged ends are ends where the microbes can invade. Simultaneously then, the cow has the ability to regurgitate. That's why we call them ruminants. You know, we call that process rumination where they basically regurgitate a bolus from the rumen up back into their mouth oral cavity and they chew that more. So they're making more of those damaged areas within that forage as a result of that chewing activity. And the more of those damaged regions that they create, then they swallow that again. Those damaged regions then become regions where the microbes can colonize and derive more energy from that material. So it's not like the microbes do everything. It, you know, these, we talked about you know, synergistic evolution and how things evolve together. 
And we talked about how the cow has evolved into the grassland environment, but the cow has also evolved with her own, her own microbial population. And that rumination uh, process is really critical to deriving even more energy than that, uh, what the microbes could buy, buy themselves if the cow didn't chew that material more and make it more readily available for the microbes to derive energy from. So it's a synergistic relationship on all fronts. And, and we've been speaking about cows. Um, and, and I should take this moment to, to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Tim McAllister, who's a research scientist and ruminant nutrition microbiology scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada, based in Lethbridge. Um, there are more ruminants than cows. We've mentioned them before, but it's important to, I think people have said that cows actually are eating one of the poorer quality diets um, compared to maybe some browsers that might be eating a higher quality. And that, that produces its own range of anatomical and physiological differences. Yeah, like the cows, cows typically are not quite as selective as many of the other ruminant animals might be. Uh, you know, like if you look at deer, for example, often they're browsers, so they'll be consuming, you know, green leaf material or, or other, they're, they're much more selective. We probably, I know, I know in Lethbridge, we have quite a deer population here right in the city. And you can tell they're very selective from what plants are not left over come springtime. Uh, in terms of what they've ate, what they've not ate. So that makes a big difference. You know, they may not have quite the volume, room and volume, you know, to be able to store so much of that feed and, and give that longer period of time for the microbes to digest. So they have adapted by selecting a higher quality diet as a means of still trying to drive enough energy to meet their needs versus uh, ruminant like the, the cattle, which which are more broader grazers, less selective in their in their foraging activities. Not to say that they still can't be selective, but uh, not quite so much as, as what deer would be or, or elk or other other animals. You mentioned beer brewing a little early. Have I heard mention of rumen liquor, is there? Yeah, well, that, that's the fluid. That, that, uh, <laughs> so, you know, bas basically the rumen, when we talk about an aquatic ecosystem, for the most part, it is an aquatic ecosystem because it's it's full with, with that rumen fluid. And, and that acts as a matrix to enable those microbes to move around from particle to particle. So some of those particles will be completely digested, right? And, and, and be completely broken down into these byproducts. And those microbes are then released into the fluid and then they can float around until they find another piece of feed that they can colonize and carry out digestion. So that fluid nature, if, if animals become dehydrated to the point that it affects the fluidity within the room and then that can have a negative impact on digestion as well. Yeah. Um, the aspect, and it just came up because of some recent literature, but people are doing some supplementing of bypass, you know, feed ingredients. So, and this was specifically talking about, um, some protected for rumen protected forms of lysine and methionine to dairy cattle and, and yeah so what, what what's that about and what other things besides amino acids might be something people would know or hear about in that regard yeah so from from that perspective um you know when we talk about beef cattle um we're really talking about animals. If, if you look at the beef cattle production systems, we have beef cattle that are distributed across the landscape, right, in these extensive systems. And as I mentioned, those extensive ecosystems vary dramatically depending upon where you're located within North America. You know, if you look at the rangeland in Arizona versus the rangeland that we would encounter up in the Peace River uh, counties, and that that I described earlier, it's vastly different. So the optimal animal that's adapted to those environments differs. So the a cow that'll do really good in Arizona is not the same type of cow that'll do really good up in the Peace River country here, up here. So that's why we have the degree of diversity within our beef cattle production system. If we look at our dairy production system, it's been much more intensive in terms of its development. You know, the majority of, of dairy cows spend a large portion of their time within very environmentally controlled barn systems, not unlike what a, a lot of poultry and swine do in terms of how those systems are built. 
And then we've, we've placed a lot of genetic selection for animals to excel within that controlled environment. Uh, and, and, you know, that's been a focus on milk production. And, and that, you know, to very, very high levels, if you look at the statistics on milk production, it continues to increase. So the number of cows that we need to produce a given quantity of milk continues to decline, you know, all the time. Uh, and, and so as a result of those selection processes, we've, we've really selected those animals for a very high level of production, production that's much higher than what would just be needed to satisfy the offspring that they have. You know, whereas within a beef cow production environment, we're looking at producing, having that cow produce enough milk to meet the needs of the offspring, right? We're not really wanting excess milk beyond that. That's the difference between beef and dairy. And, and in that selection process, then, we have selected those animals to the point where they have extremely high feed intakes, but certain nutrients, even with the, that high level of activity that I talked about within the rumen uh, microbial activity and the ability to synthesize those amino acids in that, uh, the amount of intake, the amount of malproduction may be just so high that that microbial population cannot meet the need of those essential amino acids. And those essential amino acids become rate limiting to the milk production process. And so then as a result, then as a result, the um, need then becomes that we need to uh, bypass that amino acid so that it flows through the rumen, ends up in the small intestine and is absorbed and utilized there uh, for the animal and meets those uh, potential deficiencies that may take and, and milk production then can stay at that very optimal high level. And I, I, I think that some fats people have looked at doing a yeah. similar thing to get energy. Same, same idea. That's from an energy perspective there. So, uh, but those are what we call protected fats. We, we already talked about how fats can have a negative impact on the rumen if the concentrations are too high. Uh, but by using those protected fats, they don't have that uh, negative interaction with the rumen microbial population. They also flow through uh, into the lower tract and are, are absorbed there and used in, uh, as an energy source. And fats have all, you know, twice the energy content of carbohydrates. So, so uh, they can be an effective energy source in those high production situations as well. So again, um, primarily dairy, but it is something that's being used. Yeah, I think, I think the use in, in the beef cows and, and it's relatively limited uh, because they don't have those, high of energy demands and because uh, their protein and amino acid requirements can be met by the uh, optimizing microbial protein synthesis. In the and, and these would be a, at some cost as an input. So that is definitely factor. In yeah. Beef. And it's another reason, you know, the margins are higher in dairy as well. So uh, they, they fit economically better into the diets than they do into beef. Um, if, if I think about plant, uh, dry matter from plants, we can broadly define that into cell walls and cell contents. And so the cell contents are readily available to fermentation because those would be sugars and those would be proteins and some other kind of proteins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that would also uh, impact stage of maturity of the forage. That yeah, they... that has a huge impact. That's that's why we typically, like up here, we we calve in the springtime, you know, and then the springtime is when the grass is in the vegetative stage. So the protein content is the highest, the digestibility of the cell walls are the highest at that point. So the amount of energy in that material and the availability and digestibility of it by the room of microorganisms is at its highest. And that's at the time just after gestation where we need the most, you know, milk production uh, needs to increase and, and uh, you know, optimal nutrients provided to that young calf before they've really uh, developed any self-sufficiency in terms of really grazing on their own and that. So uh, that's why we time it in, in that manner is to make sure that we, you know, matching the nutrient requirements of the cow, which varies depending upon stage of gestation, uh, is an important concept, and we do that by matching it when the when the forages are most digestible as well. Transitioning a little, um, I've heard of a phrase "one health," and I'm not exactly sure what that means. I think I know, but if it, it, I've seen it listed on your extensive list of of research projects and interests, so could you help me understand what one health is? Yeah, so, you know, probably where the area of One Health has been most 
applied to to date is related to antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so in the use of antimicrobials in both humans, livestock, crop production, and the implications for the environment. So One Health really involves encompassing a cycle of health that includes the health associated with the food production system, the health associated with the environment, uh, and the health associated with uh, urban uh, centers and the health associated with humans as a whole. And the interlinkages that occur between that and a realization of those interlinkages so that management practices or decisions that are made from the perspective of a respect for all of those components. Okay. And it's really, it's really been, you know, and a lot of that has come because of the uh, growing amount that we hear about antimicrobial resistance, the use of antimicrobials in human medicine, in livestock production, in crops as well, and the implication that that has in terms of flow of antimicrobial resistance organisms or the genes that code for resistance into the environment. You know, a lot of that comes from human waste streams as well, like sewage treatment plants and that, and the release of that material into the waterways has an implication on the environment and, and, and whether antimicrobial resistance is going to travel downstream from that point source or not. So that's really what the One Health concept is, is about. Uh, but you can apply it to other, you know, like nutrient flows in general. You could you could apply the same concept to nitrogen or phosphorus, you know, and, and the implications that that has for that entire community. And, and a lot of that then is connected to sustainability because, you know, when we talk about sustainability, if we're talking livestock production, then we're looking at it from the sustainability of the livestock production sector. But then we also need to consider sustainability of the environment and the sustainability of the production of that food to maintain humanity. So you can look at that from a One Health perspective as well. And you know, when you make management decisions or recommend best management practices, regardless of what sector you're talking about, whether you're talking about the urban community or the farming community or the environmental community, you're making those decisions from the perspective of a consideration of their impact on that entire One Health continuum. One of, I, I just recently came across the uh, suggestion that there's a concern with um, the quality of some pharmaceutical um, antibiotic or antimicrobial for human use coming out of the generic drug sector, that the quality sometimes is, is less uh, efficacious than... Uh, brand names or what have you, and that that could be an issue in humans who aren't getting the therapeutic response from a given dose that they should be from. Yeah, yeah. So when 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 antimicrobials are approved for use in livestock or humans or crops, there is an extensive process that goes through a very expensive process in terms of evaluation and regulation by both, you know, primarily by the public health entities, but also environment and uh, veterinary groups as well. Uh, you know, our, our food inspection, USDA, they, they all have input into those assessments. Um, and, and, and so there are a number of factors when they go through that, the drugs are rigorously tested, you know, for things like what is the optimal therapeutic dose? Uh, when is that uh, administered? Under what conditions of clinical, of clinical signs, you know, uh, to which uh, animals are, where are they, you know, not, not antimicrobials are approved for use in all animals. So, you know, all those kinds of things, how many doses, those are all considered. And, and that also looks at, you know, whether, how long do, do any residues persist in the tissues? Do any residues persist in the environment? Those are all part of those portfolios that are put together as part of that assessment process. So there's a very rigorous process that's gone through that then results in, if it's approved, in label directions. And those label directions are based on the science that supports the use of those antimicrobials in a manner that results in the most efficacious control of disease. And, and, and so if they're not followed, or if the concentration of the active agent in that product is not what they say it is, then you can have big problems with either promoting antimicrobial resistance or thinking that you're using a product that's gonna control that disease when in fact it has no effect at all. So there's a lot of issues that can arise if there's a breakdown in that approval process aligning with how it's being used within whatever industry. 
And certainly in North America, there's been a very deliberate separation of antimicrobials that have human application from the veterinary application. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, there, that is true. There's, there, you know, it's not 100%. There are some antimicrobials. It depends if you're talking about an individual antimicrobial or a family. Uh, there, if you talk about the family, which can compose of many antimicrobials, uh, there is, you know, members of that family that may be used in livestock and members of that family that may be used in humans. There are some cases when the same antimicrobial may be used in both. Where there does tend to be a differentiation is that what we call those last reveals for treating disease in humans, you know, those ones tend to be restricted for use in humans only and not utilized very extensively in livestock. Uh, but it depends on which antimicrobial you're talking about. There, you know, if we look at the class that's used most largely in, in, in in uh, ruminant animals, that would be the ionophores uh, that are used uh, in, extensively, and they're they're used in poultry and swine as well. But they're not used in humans at all uh, at this point. So, but if you talk, you know, and if you take the other spectra, if we go to the fluoroquinolones, that which are like ciprofloxacin would be an example of that. That's used to a limited extent in livestock and much more in humans. The fluoroquinolones. So it depends on what family you're talking about. And and I think it's fair to say that most people involved in, I'll call it human husbandry or animal husbandry, recognize that it begins with proper nutrition, not with some medication. That that the medication is um, something that happens when something has out of the ordinary, not as the routine. That's correct. That's that's right. And and you know we tend to. You know, I, I talked a little bit about the trade-offs. There's, there's always trade-offs in these decisions that are made, and it really doesn't matter what form of food production you're looking at. You, you've got to recognize those trade-offs. So we talked about the value of cattle and their ability to use grassland ecosystems and how valuable the carbon that's stored there. But one of the, one of the downsides of that is that typically, you know, those animals have to walk further. Uh, the range quality may be more variable. Um, you know, and, and it can be affected by drought and all, you know, which is particularly severe in regions like in Africa and, that in, and even in Australia where, you know, droughts can lead to the point where the animals can't uh, persist in those environments even. Um, so those are some of the disadvantages of those systems. And advantage is, is that they're, the animals are, are tend to be more spread out. They're, they're not mixed as readily. Uh, and so the use of antimicrobials in that environment is less than what it is if you move into an intensive feedlot predict type of system where you're congregating animals from vastly vast geographical areas into a single site. Uh, potentially, if there is disease within some of those herds, you're bringing them in and you might be exposing additional animals within that intensive system to that, to that diseased agent. Uh, so then we have an increased reliance on the use of antimicrobials under those circumstances. The advantage, though, is that we can be very, you know, pretty precise in terms of the formulation of the diet because we're we're formulating a diet, we can calculate the nutrients that are there, and we can develop to deliver that total mixed ration, you know, on a, on a once or twice or even a three times daily basis. So really in those production systems, feed availability is seldom a negative factor. Uh, so that boosts the animal's immune system to deal with some of those challenges. Uh, and it also increases their productivity. So the feed efficiency, the amount of feed that it requires to produce a kilogram of beef, is much less in that system than it is out in that more extensive range system where the cattle may have to uh, travel much greater geographical distances to achieve feed stuffs that are less predictable in terms of their nutrient content. So it's, you need to understand those balances. And I, I think that's one of the advantages of the North American system is that we have an integrated system that has components of all of those. So we take advantage, you know, we can dramatically shorten our our, our production period by using that intensive period at the end, that 120 to 200 days at the end of the finishing period. Uh, so there's a big advantage of that. We use a lot of byproduct feeds in that that would normally, you know, really not have a market if they weren't going into cattle. So that adds sort of a value added system. So there's an advantage to that. And at the same time, we're using our extensive rangelands to maintain our cow herds and, and take value in producing food under, under those circumstances as well. Uh, 
precisely the thought that was in my mind was that these extensive systems are the cow-calf operation that then that resource isn't sufficient to finish those young animals in addition to maintaining the cow herd. So those animals have to yeah. find a new home either. Yeah, like on, there, yeah. yeah there is grass fed beef, right? You can do grass fed beef. Mm -hmm. um, probably wouldn't, uh, you know, it would be very challenged to maintain our current population, our current productivity levels that we have in terms of meat production in North America on a 100% grass based system. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's more subject to those environmental influences that I talk, talked about, because even in a feedlot, you know, we don't have them under a, under a roof, but we put up windbreak fences and we provide them with feed every day. And, you know, we provide bedding and that so that they can, you know, they don't have to wade through, through snow or things like that uh, in order to get feed. And, and so we, we've altered the environment there to some, not near as much as what we're talking about in poultry or swine or even dairy. Uh, but there are some differences there that we've made that are also more favorable for the efficiency of production. I, uh, getting down toward the end of our time together, and again, my guest today is, is Dr. Tim McAllister. Uh, I, this just came up recently in a presentation where people express their surprise that I that that a modern production system might have a lower environmental impact than what they perceived as a traditional production system in say some other country, um, and so one of your research areas is the this performance enhancing technology, reducing greenhouse gas emissions for one, but we could think of land use, we could think of water use, feed use. Yeah, yeah, so it all it all relates to, you know, the, when we make those kinds of descriptions, we're usually talking about on intensity basis. So it's whatever metric per unit of production. So it might be per liter of milk, or it might be per kilogram of meat or kilogram of carcass. Uh, those are the that's what we call an intensity uh, uh, estimate. And, and I, I argue that, you know, if we're gonna do something on an intensity basis, uh, food is probably something that can be justified being measured on an intensity basis because food's pretty important to humanity. You know, so we need food. We, we, you know, even if we, if it meant giving up food in order to lower greenhouse gas emissions, that would not be a viable option. You know, it's for perspective, you know. Can, can I quote you on that? <laughs> yes, definitely. So, you know, like measuring intensity per kilogram of car doesn't make the same sense as measuring intensity per kilogram of meat or per kilogram of milk or per kilogram of, of grain, you know, those all because of the, of the importance of food. So when we talk about those intensity measurements, then if you produce uh, that kilogram of beef with less input, whether it be, you know, less greenhouse gases being emitted, less land being utilized, uh, all of those less water for production, all of those factors. If we improve the efficiency of the production system, and when we look at a, a lot, at least particularly the water use, that really flows back to the crop production uh, because 95% of the water that's utilized for livestock feed comes from the production of the crop itself, not from direct use by the animal. Less than 5% is used by the animal directly. So um, if we make it so that then the amount of feed that's required to produce that kilogram of beef is declined, and we've got additives that will do that. The implants are a really good example of that that we use. They are the most consistent. I've tested a lot of different products and other ones that I've tested. They result in the most consistent improvement in the feed efficiency. The lowest I've ever had in any trial that I've ever conducted is a 5% improvement in feed efficiency. So it took 5% less feed to produce the same kilogram of beef. Uh, the highest I've had is around 20%. So it produced 20% less feed to produce the same kilogram of feed. So then that then uh, correlates back into then less greenhouse gas emissions, uh, both from the perspective of I didn't need as much, produce as much feed in order to achieve that kilogram of beef. Plus the animals typically will finish faster. So they're not in the feedlot as long. And so there's also less emissions as well. That means less land then to produce the crops because uh, we don't need as much feed. It, it has a cascading effect in terms of sustainability that goes across 
across that production continuum. And I think most people don't realize, you know, and the same thing with those implants, the same sort of rigorous testing and assessment that I mentioned and described for antimicrobials, those go through that same uh, regulatory procedure in order for them to be utilized. So, you know, ultimately, it's always the consumer's choice in terms of what they want to eat. So if they want to eat beef with horm, you know, with those implants used or without those implants used, that's their choice to make that decision. One of our objectives is to make sure they're making that decision from an informed perspective, that they realize the trade-offs that exist. And that if you want to pull those implants out because you don't want to see them used in beef cattle production system, you got to realize then it's going to take more land. It's going to take more, more feed. It's going to take more water. It's going to produce more greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're fine with that, that's, that's your decision. But you should be realizing that when you make that decision process. And I think in many cases, uh, consumers are not fully informed in those trade-offs. And that's one of the key uh, objectives of our research program is to make people aware. Uh, we, we, we could make the absurd argument that if all you were worrying about was, you know, emission intensity to produce calories, you could grow sugar cane. Um, yes. Um, and just recently, I, I saw a paper um, that is trying to incorporate the not just amino acid content of food and therefore looking at that in terms instead of crude protein, um, but then also looking at the availability or the utilizability of that lysine to humans because lysine from plant source foods, especially once they're processed, can be significantly less than that from animal source foods. And so that needs to be accounted for in our calculations. And it's yeah, yeah, like a lot of plant, plant-based plant foods will have a lot of secondary metabolites that are really there, you know, they're, they're really to protect against pathogen attack and that. And one of the ways they do that is by binding up nutrients and not making them available to the pathogens that are attacking the crops. And, and because of those secondary nutrients, if they're, you know, you can take undertake processing steps, heating and other processes that can help remove those, those secondary uh, products that can bind nutrients. But if you don't do that, then that can have a negative effect on the availability of those nutrients post-consumption in both livestock and humans. Dr. McAllister, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I hope people will forgive me for getting geeky in, in ruminant nutrition and, and physiology and things ruminant, but hey, I'm the sod father. Uh, <laughs> what do you, you, you should expect it by now. Um, again, thank you for your time. Where could people learn more about the research that's going on in your program or others at Lethbridge and and more yeah, about well, these lot, topics. You know, a lot of, like you, you mentioned Google Scholar. So a lot of my, my, all of my publications are pretty much reported on Google Scholar. That's an important one. Uh, you can also Google me and, and go to my website. There's information there as well that we've got uh, in the government of Canada. Like we're really open access now. So all of our publications are available through the internet if you reach out to find them. And uh, and then I'm, I'm happy to be contacted directly on some of these Subjects. You know, we've talked about a very broad area of topics, obviously, right? And, I, you know, I, if you look at my research background, I have a broad overview because I've worked in so many different areas. But if you go into any one of those specific areas in detail, you'll find people that are much more experts on those particular areas than I am. You know, that it, it, I have a broad overview, but to get into the, you know, the really nitty gritty, then... There are, if you're interested in one specific topic there, there are people I can direct you to that know just, you know, that's their area of focus. They're, they're not as broad perspective as, as my program has. And I'd be happy to put them in touch with those individuals as well. Perfect. Well, um, it, do you have any questions you'd like to ask me uh, since I've been abusing you for the last hour? No, I, I think it's, no, it's an enjoyable discussion. I've enjoyed it. Excellent. Um, I don't know that our paths have actually crossed um, yet, but I look forward to the next time that I get to cross the border. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're looking forward to it too. Like you know, we usually I, we're pretty close. Like I said, we're pretty close to the Montana border, and and I cycle quite a bit. So I have a I did have and prior to COVID, I had an annual trip down to Glacier National Park and cycling up, going to the Sun Road before the. Uh, 
it opened up to traffic every year we would do that and unfortunately in the last couple of years we didn't really do that because we can't get across the border but you know I, have you been to glacier national park I, I was I spent a little time in Bozeman many many years okay. ago and and yeah. made one visit and I'd like to get back. Yeah, the going to the Sun Highway is really well. It's one of the iconic bike rides in North America for sure. So it's yeah. What, what kind and, you know of they have the you have? they they plow snow there till usually it opens up about the last week of June or so. So they'd be still plowing snow there now. So yeah, indeed. Well. Until the next time then, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Peter. I enjoyed it.